Thanks, everyone, and good afternoon. I am delighted to be here, as always. Um, and so, without further ado, we are going to be talking today about the auditor's chair. Before we do that, though, let us set the stage and talk about what's going to get us to the point where it's actually important or meaningful to talk about the auditor's chair. So let's talk about all of the negative baggage, all of the emotions that accompany auditing. Anybody? What do we have? Fear. What else? Anger. What else? Uncertainty, frustration, anger, discomfort. Anything else? A visit from my mother in law. Visit from your mother in law. <laughs> Being in pain, indignation. What is this person doing in my space? All of these are very real and very potent emotions. And I've spoken about this before and I've talked about some of the issues that we have with auditing. It doesn't go away. It's a reality and it is important therefore to dispel some of these negative emotions and a lot of this ugly, ugly baggage that stands between you and your goal. And so what is your goal? What is the purpose of doing the audit? Anybody? Improvement. What else? Oh, come on. Louder, louder. Come on. Review effectiveness. Review effectiveness. OK, we've got several different things. We, we want for this audit to, to be productive. We need for the audit program to be effective. We need for it to produce results. So I ask you, what's the most significant or the most obvious part of the audit? Well, it's the audit interview. So it stands to reason that if you're going to have an effective audit process and if you're going to be able to achieve the results that you desire, that it's important to have an effective audit interview. So, what stands between you and having an effective audit interview? Now, well, there are a lot of obstacles. There's a lot of baggage that we've talked about. But I want to focus on one thing. We're going to take all of this stuff and we're just going to focus on the auditor's chair. Why is it a big deal for the auditor to be able to sit down? This is not about being stoic. I know people who think that they should be able to walk around all day. Now, you're looking at a situation where many of the facilities that we're walking around, concrete floors, you're walking around all day long, three, four hours, your feet hurt, your back aches, your knees are starting to get kind of wobbly. All of these are distractions. What's the problem with distractions? They stand between you and your ability to be present, to be fully present to the person with whom you are speaking. Now, what does it mean to be fully present to the person that you're speaking with. It means that you ask very deliberate and perceptive questions. You frame those questions so that they are intelligible to the person who needs to respond. It means that you are sensitive to all the nuances of the conversation. It means that you are able to understand the answers that you are attentive to the answers that the auditee is giving you. And you are able to make decisions on the spot as to whether or not the evidence that's been given through the interview 
and through the examination of records, demonstrates fulfillment of the requirements. That's a lot of stuff to do at 4 o'clock in the afternoon if you're standing on your feet and you're tired and you're hurt. And you still have to be fully present to that person because it's also a matter of courtesy. You know, it's easy to be fresh at 7, seven o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, not so bad, although, you know, it's getting close to lunch. 4 o'clock in the afternoon, it's hard. But this is not about feeling good. This is about having a productive interview. And you cannot have a productive interview if you have these distractions, if you are just dying to be done with this conversation so you can go somewhere and sit down in your car. You control the tone. You control the atmosphere. You have to control this. And being stoic and thinking, I'm going to stand, and not asking for a chair, or thinking that you, it, it's not, it, it does not serve the purpose. Get over yourself. Ask for the chair. So, that's the first reason that you should ask for a chair. The second reason you should ask for a chair is quite frankly, it's a lot easier if you're sitting down to get access to a flat surface so you can write stuff down. If you're standing, you're fumbling with your papers, you got the pen here, you got the standard, you got the checklist, and if you're standing up like this, you got no place to write. You're like, you're like, you know, you're like this. If you're sitting down, odds are a lot greater you are going to have a desk or another flat surface that you can actually write on. The third reason is that more and more, and we were just discussing this actually when someone was talking about documents, more of our stuff is electronic. So you're looking at people's computer screens. That was not the case 10, 15 years ago. More and more of the records you're looking for, they're showing you the email trail that shows that the customer made this request, they're showing you the database, they're showing the SBC charts, and they're showing the real-time monitoring of processes, and they're showing you the, the, the scanned-in PDFs of certificates of analysis, everything's on the computer. And you're standing up and you're leaning over and you're leaning in and you're leaning in like this. Um, it's uncomfortable. Because one of those other subtle things that we don't pay attention to, and there's a lot of little things that you need to pay attention to in your auditing, a lot of body language stuff, is the thing about personal space. You're leaning in and you're like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. And you know, I, it's really funny, several years ago I was doing some work with um, one of my clients, and I'd known him for several years, and um, he was from the Middle East, very, very sweet gentleman. And uh, I got a little too close to him. And you know, it's this whole thing of, of you know, personal space. And so I'm kind of like leaning in and leaning in, and he looks over at me, you know, does one of these. And then he says, oh, well, at our age, what difference does it make? <laughs> Doesn't you get personal space? So this whole thing of that awkwardness, you know, trying to see, whereas if you're sitting down, they just tilt the screen so you can both see and you can look at the same time. So, you know, so, 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 so far we've got three things. Um, oh, the, the, the first thing also I wanted to mention, I have another ad go, going back to, and I, 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 I can't pass this one up, and I can't believe I forgot it, having to do with this whole thing of being on your feet all day long. Last month, I did some auditor training for a facility that had one building that was a mile long. And the person who was in charge of uh, setting up the whole training had decided that I should do some sample audits to demonstrate how great an auditor I am, and <clears throat> selected processes that were at opposite ends of the plant. Swear to God, it is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I'm doing one audit knowing in Half an hour, I'm going to have to walk one mile down to the other end of the facility to do that second audit. And thank you, Lord, when I got to the other end, we were able to sit down and sit in the little lunch area where all the workers were because <laughs> there's no way I was going to be able to stand. Because uh, I, I also had not planned on it. I did not have the right shoes for this. The final reason to sit down 
is to be at the same level with the person that you're speaking with. You know, if you're standing and they're sitting, you know, you, you've got that whole subordinate, superior thing going on. You know, they're sitting there looking up at you, they're already scared, and they're like, yes, Sister Mary of perpetual scariness. <laughs> you know, and just, so you sit down, you're at the same level, and you're talking, and we're just having a conversation. You control this environment. This is really important. Think about all of the impressions that come out of this. So we've established, I hope we all established the value of actually having the auditor sit down. Have I made my case? Okay, yay, she made her case. So, now comes the next question. Who was responsible? Oh, we already did the who cares. There's me with all my papers. I, <laughs> you have to forgive me because I'm trying something new here, and I first thought that I was going to do this without a PowerPoint presentation, and I've discovered we've become addicted to PowerPoint presentations. It's kind of like it's your guide. It kind of like does the whole tempo thing for you and all that. So if it's a little clunky here, it's because I was trying to do that, and I ended up yesterday afternoon going, no, I can't do it without slides. So, <laughs> so I put these slides together. So, who was responsible for getting you a chair? And <laughs> you think that this is an easy question? Well, yeah, let's think about this here. So who's the person who normally is your escort? Who usually travels with you? Uh, the quality manager, that's number one, or the ISO management rep, or if it's two people on a team, they might split it and they'd have like the plant manager, they might have a VP. Have you noticed the theme here? You know, what, what's the commonality here? We all have manager level people. We have people who have MBAs, they have 20 years of managerial experience, and you're over there saying, get me a chair. You've just basically demoted them to being extras in a Tarzan movie. Yes, Boana, I will fetch you a chair. So I am always really, really, really very judicious, very polite and very careful how I request that chair. But the reality is, is that I need a chair, I need to sit down. So this individual dutifully goes and brags back a chair. Okay, brings you a chair. Now, you're thinking, so what? So what's the big deal here? Well, the big deal is that this is a three-day audit. Now, granted, you're gonna spend some of your time out on the manufacturing floor, but the rest of the time, you're going to be in various Dilbert cubicles throughout this facility, and so you're going to have to make this request over and over and over again. Yes, Buana, I will get you another chair. So it really is a matter, I mean, you really have to be very sensitive to the fact that you've got a manager who's fetching for you. It's that the tone you want to set for the audit. So you've got to be very, very careful about how you make this request. So, but, so let's say that you get tired of this. You know, you get to the point where you just don't want to ask this soul to get you a chair one more time. Because every time you do, it's kind of like you don't even have to ask anymore, you just kind of do one of these things. And he's like, yeah, I'll get you a chair. And you know, and you just, you get that whole body language that they're really tired of playing fetch. So you decide that you're gonna go out on a limb and you are going to select your own chair. Okay. So, is this chair being used? Now, you use your extraordinary powers of observation as an auditor. You know, you look at the desks in an area, you've got three different desks to choose from, and so you obviously do not want to pick that desk because obviously there's a cup of coffee and the highlighter has got the cap off and obviously somebody's working there and they just walked away. So you look for the place where there's no coffee cup, the computer's not on. The only problem with that is that there are some very, very neat people in the world. You know, I mean, if my desk doesn't have any paper on it, it means I'm not home. So you make the mistake of grabbing, and you just grab, it's like, yeah, nobody's sitting there, I'll grab that chair. Okay. And you plunk yourself down on it, and you start talking. And three minutes later, the owner of the chair comes in, you know, does one of these, what the heck's going on? And you know, you're the auditor, and now 
the obnoxious, arrogant so-and-so of an auditor has taken the chair, not asked permission, just grabbed the chair without consideration. That's their take on it. So they've been told not to tick off the auditor. Remember, everybody tells their people, do not do anything to tick off the auditor. So this humble individual bites his tongue and then mumbles something about, oh, I really didn't need my chair, and walks away. At which point, you as the auditor have two choices. You can either do the, the big giant apology, prolifically apologizing, oh, I'm so sorry I took your chair, and give it back to them, here you can have your chair, which puts you back in hovering mode, and you either get another chair, or you're back in hovering mode, and you certainly do not want to look over at the quality manager because you have to now admit that you grabbed the chair without asking him to get you one, and the whole awkwardness is there. So, so, but your other choice is to remain seated in the chair, thinking, I'm only going to be here for about 10 more minutes, and if he really needs a chair, all he has to do is say he needs a chair, which leaves that individual with the impression that you are indeed a blankety-blank so-and-so. Okay, so that's another piece of awkwardness here. A lot of stickiness here. You know, remember, you're a foreigner in this land. You are a guest in this facility. Okay, so let's say that you do grab a chair and it's not one that's, that belongs to somebody. In all instances, if you have the choice, you must always go for the chair with wheels because Office furniture is a lot heavier than it looks. And if you grab one that does not have wheels on it, now again, you've only got one hand because you got your papers and you got your pen and you got your standard and you're tired and you're dragging this thing and this thing weighs about 10 tons more than you thought it was and you do not make a very pretty sight. And they're looking at how awkward and stupid and obnoxious and ridiculous you look dragging this chair so that you can sit down. And, you know, auditors do not want to look stupid and awkward, but we do. Okay, so once you get to where you're going, so you've, you've selected one with wheels, and I have got to laugh because the gentleman in the back of the room, the AV folks who help us out with all of this, I believe it was Tim said to me, he says, you know, you can adjust anything you want on this chair. I ain't touching nothing on this chair. Because I got to tell you, Murphy's Law is in high gear. You touch anything on this thing, you try to adjust the back, the lumbar, the height. Guaranteed, you are going to flip yourself backward or you are going to plunge yourself down to preschool levels and look like a fool. Ooh, one more time. Do not touch anything on the chair. If you don't like where it is, just live with it. You at least have something to sit on. So. If you're in a chair, one of the really cool things about having a chair that you're wheeling around on is that if you have a small area and you're interviewing two or three people, I did this once with uh, a purchasing function and it worked out really great. It was like process approach on wheels. It was like, so show me the audit reports. So that's the supplier audit reports. And you got the purchase orders. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And you're doing the monitoring over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let me see that other one that you had over there. Yeah, yeah. It worked out great. But you don't want to wheel too far. Going down the corridor is a no-no. Little space, not but no bigger than this. I actually had a client, I'd been going there for several years, so I really want to believe that he was kidding, who offered to wheel me down the corridor. <laughs> I declined. So, all right. So. We've gone through the whole thing of all of the things that could go wrong with the chair and, you know, all the really cool things that you can do with that. So now we're finished and the next question is, now we've done that one. See, I'm really messed up on the slides here. Whose responsibility is it to put the chair back? Remember, if you borrow a chair, the farther away you are, there's an exponential mathematical thing that somebody's going to figure out that the farther away you are from where you got the chair, the less likelihood you are you're going to get it back to the right place. And so it's like, where do we get this chair from? And it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. 
The escort is as tight as you are, and the two of you are like, where the hell did you get this chair from? I have no idea. He has, <laughs> he has no more idea than you know where the heck the chair came from. So try not to get a chair from too far away from its source. However, if you know, your, your quality manager, the escort is with you, if he decides to go halfway across the office compound in order to get a chair, then you know, I didn't ask him to do that. But he's trying to be nice to the auditor. So, who cares? This is my auditor chair. I thought it was a cool thing. Is it important? Everything you do as an auditor is important. Your body language, the way you treat people, the way you talk to people. Everybody in that office, everybody in that plant is going to remember that you were there. Because the auditors only come twice a year, and it's usually an event. We, you know, we could talk about how it's supposed to be a regular thing. This is about improvement, da 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 da, da all that. But the reality for these folks is that your being there is an event, and they're going to remember. They're going to remember how you were in their space. They're going to remember how you made them feel. They're going to remember if you really invaded their body, their, their body space, their physical, personal space. They're going to remember if you were an interloper and came in and grabbed their stuff. They're going to remember how you treated the quality manager if you made him look like he was just some slave that was doing fetch for you. They're going to remember how you talk to people. They're going to remember your body language. They're going to remember whether or not they came in and saw you doing something, and the rest of their attitude is going to be, yeah, that so-and-so came in, should have seen the way she was around the office. We can do with that kind of attitude. They're going to remember all that. And you know what else they're going to remember? They're going to remember that not only for you. They're not going to just say, Denise was an obnoxious so-and-so when she came in. This reflects on all auditors. Anytime auditors do things that are embarrassing, that are stupid, that are obnoxious, that give off the sense of being cavalier, disrespectful, it reflects on all of us. It makes us all look bad. I take enormous pride in my, in my work as an auditor. I have a lot of fun with it, but I do take great pride in it. And I am very embarrassed when people will say to me, well, you know, this other guy was in here, and you should have seen it. It's like, you know, I, I, you don't want to hear it. It's difficult to comment on it because of the code of ethic. So don't be the person who behaves in a manner that would cause people to have this attitude, this, this remembrance of all auditors. It's late in the day, and I had decided that I was not going to go the whole 45 minutes because it's late in the day, and it, I just wanted to have something that was light and that was fun, but that actually talked about something that is very, very important, and that's the way we treat one another, the way we treat our clients, and the impression that we leave of our profession. So with that, I want to say thank you, and I want to ask if anybody has any war stories or anything else that they would like to share to add to, to what I've already said. The floor is open to my colleagues. And if you don't have anything to say, then you, you get an extra 15 minutes to hang out. We have a question. Uh, uh, you would not believe, this is like, I have like one, two, there's like six giant lights up here, so, excuse me, I believe. Yeah, so thank you for your presentation. You are very welcome. You touched on the end, kind of the false things we do, how we impact that. How would you really address it that way? Because you're somewhat accountable to the person you're trying to work with, sure. But sometimes you're coming in contact with folks that dress a little differently. So how do you strike that balance or any suggestions around that? I think dressing professionally is extremely important. Um, I just said to someone, um, I've got a client right now in a foundry, and they said, you know, it's a really dirty environment. Don't wear your good clothes. And I'm like, yes, I can wear, you know. So, you know, you've, so there's an appropriateness to the environment that you're in. But, you know, I talked a few minutes ago about leaning in. I mean, ladies, come on. If you've got giant bazoomas, doing this is really not fair. I mean, really, I mean, that's the bottom line on appropriateness. I mean, dress in a manner that suits what you're doing. 
<laughs> I think I made my point. <laughs> um, anything else? That was a great question, by the way. Yes, Paul. My, Paul I, I, go to his session tomorrow. Paul is an awesome speaker. Whatever he, he opens his mouth, pearls come out. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. I hadn't even thought of doing that. Thank you. Look, did I not tell you? Pearls. It, that, I had not thought to say. I mean, we talk about personal protection year and, you know, all these other stuff. And when am I, do you, and make sure you order my lunch. Um, but <laughs> make sure that there's chairs. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. You're absolutely right. That's a great point, Paul. Asking permission. I ask permission for a whole bunch of the different things. The other thing is um, tools, especially um, if you're in a machine shop and you've got tool makers. Tool makers have tools that they, they know how to treat their tools. And if you're going to pick that up to look at the calibration sticker, it is, may I pick up your tool? And you pick that up gingerly and you handle it with reverence because that's the way they handle their tool. Anybody else? Yes, milady, what do you got? Was that part of the audit? <laughs> Um, I have never had uh, a SWAT team surround my audit area. <laughs> I imagine that's something to look forward to. Um, <laughs> but I have had things like, for example, um, had power outages, and everybody thought, oh, she's going to stop, and it's like, nope, let's go over to the offices that are near the windows, we'll, we'll just change the schedule, and they're like, oh, God, <laughs> she's tough. So you try and accommodate it as much as possible. Um, I've never had, no, I do, ha I had one instance where I had to leave early and it was not um, a situation of, um, of an emergency. It was um, uh, an assembly that had uh, a particular process that was very, that generated a great deal of heat and they had a rule that if the temperature hit 95 that everybody got sent home because it just wasn't safe for the workers. So it was like um, 1.45, and I'm like, yep, I'm going down. We're going to do the audit over in the area where they do the molds. And they're like, we're sending everybody home at 2 o'clock, Denise. Temperature just hit 95. I went, okay. So they gave everybody a fudgicle as they were going out the door, and they had some left over, so I got one. Um, but, I mean, you try to handle the situation. Usually, some, you, you can find another way to accommodate it. If you can't, then the audit stops. But again, haven't had the SWAT team yet. Okay, anybody else? I love these comments, please. Oh, yes, Paul. I had one where the, oh, wow. Uh, I had one where I was at a printing company and the fellow who ran the forklift uh, picked up the highest stack of material from the top of the rack and as he came back, he hit the uh, fire alarm sprinkler system and their whole, all their stock got wet. Huge, huge warehouse. And so everybody went outside. And so I think the only way out in, a, in one like that is you have to go back when everybody gets back in the building and have sort of a second opening meeting. Did you ask them what their process was when the, all the inventory gets oh, wet? Oh, you know, that's that. Yeah. Yeah. Did I rub it in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's kind of like you have, you have to recalibrate. And, and if you do it officially, I think that's probably the smartest thing. Uh, so no matter what it is, if, it, if it's going to wreck your schedule, uh, you, you agree, Denise? Maybe go back to square one and say, okay, we, we lost all of this. Here's how we're going to make it up. Yeah. So, and, and this is thinking on your feet, right? Yeah. yeah, we do a lot of thinking on our feet. You're absolutely right. Okay, anybody else? Oh, this has been great to have these little comments after. I thank you so very much, all of you, for contributing. And are we...
Any more hands? Are we done? I thank you all very much.